Okay, let's open up. We've got a lot to pray for. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and for the sunshine. And uh, I got a long list here, Lord. I need you to be with Bruce. I'm not sure. I just know he's not feeling well. So please put your healing hand on him. We thank you for Nancy's progress so far, but she still was not comfortable with being in, in a crowd. She's still doing some sneezing and uh, coughing. So keep your healing hand on her. But we, we do thank you for how well she's feeling at this point. Also, um, be with Maureen. Uh, she is having some issues because of a medication. So uh, keep your healing hand on her. And uh, Vicki has had a strange week, a challenging week. Uh, week. And so Heavenly Father, just be with her and help her in whatever way she needs, because I am not sure all the things that are happening to her. I do know she her car caught fire. So uh, just help her, Lord, in what, however way that she needs you to be there. Heavenly Father, uh, be with Debbie. Uh, she's the healthy one, <laughs> and uh, but she is doing um, work for her organization that she spends so much time on uh, at the library and uh, just make sure that she's safe in her travels, and um, I'm told that both of them will be back next week, and Heavenly Father, just be with us today as we see how the Israelites knock themselves out of the promised land. And Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for those that are here today. And hopefully we will have a great class. And Lord, just be with us too, taking us safely back home. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The question. It says, the Israelites often often suffered from a lack of proper perspective. In what ways does a person's perspective define his or her reality? Yes, Caroline. Most people's perspective is what they can do themselves to solve a problem. They don't ask God for help until it gets really difficult or big to handle. It is always thinking, what can I do to fix things? We all need guidance from God. Common sense is valuable in accomplishing God's purposes. And that I got from Proverbs 12, 15. Okay. Anybody else? I said to have the proper perspective, you need as many facts as possible. And pray for guidance. Yep. It, 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 sometimes there's more than one side to a story. I was thinking about how Pastor Don always said, the way you, you go in is the way you come out. So if you're going in with a bad attitude, you're going to come out with a bad attitude. Oh, very good. That? No, so, but that's okay. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Love that John quote. <laughs> But, you know, he said when you, like, you approach the Bible and a lot of different things, the way you go in is the way you come out. So you got to go in with an open mind. True. That's so true. Well, and we know for a fact that you can read the same scripture every day for 30 days. Oh, yeah. And every day you'll get a different message out of it. It's not like, okay, I'm going to read this and that's the message. No. Yeah. It's, it's where you are, where your brain is, and that as to what message you get from that, you know, that reading. But so that kind of goes hand in hand with how you go in. You know. So, yeah, I, uh, I wrote how we look at things determines how we will react in situations. However, we will act to fix a problem we have perceived and how we deal with our lives. I think that, you know, whatever's going on in our life, 
is our perspective, right? And so if it's not going very well, where's our perspective? It's not going very well. <laughs> no. And so, you know, that's why prayer is so important, you know, because if we open up and really and pray to the Lord, but listen, you know, because just praying to him doesn't accomplish anything. Because if we don't, if we're not quiet and take quiet time to pray and then listen for the answer, you know, we're not, the prayer isn't going to mean anything if we pray and then we rush off somewhere. So you need that quiet time. Or even if you're reading scripture, when you're reading scripture, you need to have some quiet time with it. You know, don't read in, in, you know, the family room with the TV on and all of this because God speaks through scripture too. And I found a lot that when I'm doing the lesson, God talks to me. He shows me new things. He, you know, brings them out to me. And, uh, and so I, I know that he speaks here. I got my answer for a question I had before I went to seminary, and it was in the Bible. So, you know, sometimes we just have to be quiet. We have to do something. What is that? Sounds like a drum to me. Oh, yeah. They have all the doors open for the heat, I think. So it heats up. Yeah, because the music room is right through there. It's on the other side. But, okay. Well, let's go on. I, I really, I enjoyed looking at this lesson. Um, the Israelites often brought misfortune on themselves by choosing to complain and disobey God. Yet in spite of these setbacks, God led them on to, until they arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, the border to the promised land. Israel was on the doorstep and God was about to fulfill their promise to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. So Moses sent 12 men one from each tribe of Israel to spy out the land and plan a military strategy. Strategy. The spies soon discovered the land was already populated. That, what's more, the people who lived there were powerful. Some of them were giants. It's true, the land was fertile. It took two men to carry a bunch of grapes. But how were the Israelites to defeat such powerful armies? This is, at least, was the perspective of the ten of the spies. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, saw things differently. Joshua had been serving as Moses' personal assistant during the trek from Egypt. We know little about Caleb's background, but what we do know is that he had the right attitude toward God. Both he and Joshua agreed that while there were powerful armies and walled cities in Canaan and even giants, I have this double underlined and highlighted, God was more powerful. He would conquer these enemies just as he had conquered Pharaoh's army. Joshua and Caleb focused on the fact that God's word had been true concerning the richness, richness of the land, so his word would also prove true concerning the enemies who lived there. In this way, they demonstrated they had complete faith in the character of God. They proved to be men of great courage, and we can learn much from their attitude. I looked up because we, we weren't required to look at uh, the listing. And I'm not going to read the list because I can't pronounce half of the words anyway. But I want, what I found out, it says, I'm going to tell you the significance of the listing of the names in those verses, 3 through 15. The names add a certain historical quality. Two, they provide a level of accuracy in the narrative. Three, they should give the occasion for pride of family, clan, 
and tribe. So because there was one person out of every tribe, and we know there were 12 tribes. They become, because of the failure of the majority, markers of sadness, just as the names of places of Israel's judgment, which one, uh, one of which we talked about was Jabberah uh, last week. Uh, five, like all lists of names in scripture, they remind us of the significance of names to God. And uh, the name listed, the names listed are those of tribal leaders and their respective tribes. So the list, when you look at it, it'll tell you where they're from. The tribe of Reuben, the tribe of, of Simeon, the tribe of Judah. And those are the names of the 12 tribes. Um, if we look... If we look at verse 16, it said. Did they change Joshua? Did they change uh, Hosea's name to Joshua? Yes. Mm -hmm. if, you, if we look at verse 16, it says, These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hose, Hose, Hosea, it's Hosea, I think, not. Uh, anyway, son of Nun the name Joshua. So the significance of Joshua is noted in verse 16. He was an attendant of Moses, which we, I earlier read in the beginning of the lesson, from his youth and concerned about Moses' reputation. Moses changed his name from Hosea to Joshua. Hosea means salvation. Joshua means Yahweh saves. And Caleb, he was from the tribe of Judah. Now, in your book, it says that, uh, that Joshua, he has a different meaning for Joshua. I got to see where it is. Oh, it means the, the Lord is salvation, is what he has in the book. But in my commentary, it said it means Yahweh saves, which is basically again. the same thing. Say that again, what your book says. Yahweh saves. Um, that's not unusual that, you know, uh, there can be a difference in, but it, I mean, either way it means uh, that God saves. <laughs> so, um, anyway, mo uh, moving on. Uh, verse 17, when Moses sent them to explore, explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind, uh, what kind of land do they live, live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they on walled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile, fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the uh, desert of Zin as far as Rohab toward Lo Lobo, Hamath. They went up through Negev and came to Hebron where Hyman, Shishai, uh, Shishai and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived he, Hebron had been built seven years before Zone in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol. Because of the cluster of grapes, the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So, uh, so here they go. 
Now, they've all seen the same thing, right? It's not like, you know, one group went one way and one group another. Um, so Moses never doubted the Lord would provide victory for his people as they entered Canaan. His intention in sending out these spies was to plan strategy. I mean, well, Moses more or less says that. He wants them, he gave them a whole list of stuff they were to check out, right? Because they were going to use that information as to how to go in and overtake the people. But God was going to help them. Moses knew that. Joshua and Caleb knew that. They had the faith. But the other 10 spies, for some reason, were scared by the giants. It said, the Lord wants his people to trust him in all things, but we are also called to live responsibly. This is the last sentence under verse 17. I have it highlighted and underlined, including planning ahead as much as humanly possible. I find that interesting that, uh, you know, the planning ahead as much as humanly possible. I'm a planner. I mean, I've already, you know, got Thanksgiving. My Christmas gifts are done. <laughs> Not wrapped, but they're done. And about two weeks, I'm going to be mailing my Christmas box to Clint because he, his family, because they're not going to be up and I'm not going to go down for Christmas, which I debated uh, because in January, I'm going to visit with my sister. And so because I have, we haven't seen each other since she left Maryland. And uh, I want to make sure that she's telling me all the truth, that she's not skipping things. You know, I'm eight years older than her, but I'm healthier than her. Uh, and I, I really, uh, I, this has been on my brain for several years or more. And I just, you know, never made it out there. But I used to go out there like three times a year when she lived there the first time. She lives in Las Vegas. I mean, no, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, well, anyway. Uh, he, um, now with 20, um, I, he, I, there's some things that I think he puts in the book, the author, but it's really not in scripture. Right. And like, be of good courage. Uh, and uh, and I, I mean, I must have read the same thing over and over and over looking for that. And it's just not there. And, uh, and it just bugs me when that happens because, you know, uh, he, uh, be of good courage. This, but I liked about this, though, he says, this is actually a command, not a mere, you know, it's not a mere uh, for, formulaic statement such as have a nice day. Moses was commanding the spies to be courageous, warning them in advance not to become overwhelmed with the obstacles that stood between them and their possession of Canaan. But I didn't see that in there either. It's not there. I, I, I even looked in other Bibles. And he puts so much emphasis on that. Yes. And when you start doing the questions and all, it's like you keep yep. coming back to that. And it's like, <laughs> it's you know, not there. You know, that sort of makes his credibility not too great. <laughs> that you would actually, I mean, it doesn't even match what 20 is in the Bible. No. Not totally. No, uh, which is discouraging. But it, yeah, he it goes really back to the question, that. the first question about lack of perspective. Well, in this case, this is his perspective, but it's not based on scripture. True. Right. So, yeah. Um, well, and, and he, um, I mean, he doesn't even say, like, don't be afraid or anything like that. It, it, there's nothing there. It's all these instructions, but there's nothing about that. 
Yeah. I even went, I thought, well, maybe it's a different verse. I even kept going down through and I never found it. So anyway, uh, if you want to know what, see what time of the year it was, he tells us it was mid-July when the grapes were uh, ripe. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, Hebron, uh, I thought this was interesting. This city was of importance to Israelites because Abraham had built an altar there and because both he and Isaac were buried there. Uh, the city had since been fortified by Canaanites. And it's, it's instructions to look at the, the front and we can see a map. And the descendants of Anak, the descendants of Anak were renowned for their great stature, much as Goliath would one day become famous for his size among the Philistines. Uh, those three gentlemen were probably specific men living in Hebron at the time. They may have been famous warriors themselves. Never heard of them. But hey, we all know Goliath, right? Um, and, well, and the grapes were so big, they carried them on a pole. I mean, I'm trying to think, well, how big? <laughs> I mean, if the branch would, they needed to carry it on a pole, how big actually were the, did you have to cut it in pieces to eat it? Just one little thing? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to picture it. Uh, but anyway, he doesn't really, it says, this demonstrates the enormous size and weight of the grapes as it required two men to carry one bush, uh, one bunch. And then I underlined this. Here was tangible proof of the Lord's promise that Canaan would be abundantly prosperous and nourishing for the people. Okay. Now we're going to read about the report. Uh, starting at verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And Caleb silenced the people before Moses said, we should go up and take possession of the land or we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelite a bad report about the land and they had that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Neph Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, came uh, from that philium. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. So here they are. They're, uh, you know, they showed them the fruit. That was the only positive. The 10, 10 of the spies gave, gave the Israelites was the fruit. From there on, it was all negative. And it was all based on what? Fear. Yeah, fear of the giants. Were not all the, not all the people were giants. It was just one group of people. And, uh, and they lived in, where was it? it? I just read it. Uh, well, they came from Nephilim. One place. And because of that, they're set, they have put the fear of God, I want to say, in, you know, but it wasn't really the fear of God, right? Really? Yeah, no, I'm not supposed to let people in 
No, no, it, they, you, you direct them down to the office. <laughs> Unless it's somebody from our class, but I doubt that. Well, they even put an extra sign out on the door that this is not the main door, that they need to go around to the front. Well, I had a man um, last week that came to the door. Now, I opened it about this far, and he is in need of a kidney. And if you've seen, you've probably seen some of his signs. They're all over uh, that he needs a kidney. And, and uh, he said, well, can I come in? I said, no. And he said, okay, if it makes you more comfortable. I said, yes. I mean, I'm the, I was the only, I'm the only person up here. Even, even the teacher wasn't over there with the kids. An investigator. Oh. You look very official. Have a badge and everything. Ooh. Well, he definitely needs to go to the office. Yeah. <laughs> he kind of knew he was in the wrong place. Because he read the sign. Yeah. You know, so, but I, so I told him to <laughs> Okay, well, good. Okay, now I lost my whole train of thought, but that's okay. Um, also, in, uh, in verse 28, it has the word but in, in, in uh, 28. But the people. But, yeah. Well, he has it here as nevertheless. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and I put but next to mine. And uh, here is the actual spirit of the spy's report. Well, yeah, it starts out. You know, it starts out negative, and that's their report. The only positive was the fruit, you know, and it gives them all the names of the people that are living there. Uh, you know, the Lord had already told Moses there were people living in the land of Canaan. And if you, I mean, your book says back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, you know, uh, but he promise that he would drive out these nations before the Israelites and give them the victory and give them victory after victory. Now, we studied this, didn't we? I mean, we went through this. We know. Uh, and they had very specific instructions when they went into battle. Uh, it says, but the people chose to act as though the Lord had not warned them. Uh, of these inhabitants, almost as if God himself had been caught by surprise or had deliberately sent them to be slaughtered. Um, they are way off base. Caleb quieted the people, and he, as your book says, demonstrated his leadership abilities by taking charge when the entire nation of Israel began to rise up against Moses, you know. And he says, we are well able to overcome it, you know, uh, because of his faith in God's promises. Um, he did not pretend there were no problems to overcome, but chose to focus on ways to overcome these obstacles. And um, it says they were, are stronger than we. This was probably true in military terms. But Pharaoh's elite army had been far stronger than the Israelites as well. But Egypt was stronger than any army in the promised land. And the Lord had utterly destroyed them. The ten spies were placing their faith in their power, not in the power of God. Isn't that, somebody said that, how, uh, Carolyn, you said, we want to we wanna do it. And, and they forgot that, that it, wasn't there, it wasn't their power they needed to rely on. It was God's power. So there was a bad report. And uh, it says, to the land that devours its inhabitants, this was simply not true. At this point, the spies were bringing a blatantly false report that contradicted the concrete evidence they had brought back. And uh, it says, all the people whom we saw. Well, this too was false. There was indeed some giants in the land, but they were probably the exception rather than the rule. See, they, they keyed in right away on the giants. 
And the giants probably weren't even 20% of the people. But that's what they keyed in on. And, uh, and so it says, when you focus on the problems that confront us rather than on God's power and faithfulness, we begin to exaggerate the situation and are soon overcome with doubt and anxiety. It says, and all these different people were living together peacefully, too. Yes. And, and they didn't mention that. Right. Well, and they were surprised with the fortified walls. But God, I mean, you know that God told Moses to ask them to look for that. Were the walls, were there walls that were fortified? He gives them in their instructions. He says, uh, are, they, are they on walled or fortified, the cities? And because that's, you need to know that for strategy. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go in there and do battle, you got to know, well, can we just, rush right into the city or do we have to climb walls mm -hmm. you know I do we think they would be hostile i mean they assumed that right away that right. they would be hostile yeah right that's where i'm going with right. well because they're looking at the size and they exaggerated it they saw them in one place they went to all these different areas and in one place they had men that were larger than normal you know and and they based that whole report on those giants. So, you know, uh, verse 33 says, uh, I gotta start. It says, We saw the Nephilim there, a descendants of Anak, come from the uh, Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. You know, uh, it says, and so we were in their sight. This is another side effect of losing our focus. We begin to worry too much about what other people think and too little about what God thinks. The Canaanites might have considered the Israelites of no consequence, but God thought otherwise. They may also have thought they could defeat and subjugate Israel. But God knew they could not overcome his power. The fact is that the people of Canaan probably did not think these things in the first place. For the fear of God had swept over the nations in that area as God led the Israelites from victory to victory. So first off, God got them out of Egypt. You know, uh, I mean, with all the... <clears throat> with all the plagues that he, he used to get them out of there. Uh, and then the army, you know, they, uh, the Pharaoh decides to follow him with the army. Well, God took care of that too, didn't he? They drowned in the Red Sea when he closed up the, the water. So, I mean, this gets around. I mean, the countries might have had a distance to travel, to see other people or whatever, but that didn't mean anything. Egypt was a powerful nation then. I mean, and they, as it said in the, I mean, they had a powerful army and uh, they were like top dog, but yet they got overtaken by God. And so what makes, why would the Israelites, knowing that, and it just, what happened? A year, a year ago? how soon we forget, you know, that what God did for them, how he got them out of Egypt. Uh, and now here they are because they saw some giants, you know, it's not going to work. So reading on in 14, the people rebel. Well, what's new? That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as blunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, 
We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathering there, gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of whatever, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. What does that mean when they're tearing their clothes? Well, it's also a way of grieving. grieving. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up, underlined. This protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So they're trying to get through to them, you know, and it says all the congregation. So we have to think that that's everybody, at least all the male population. Doesn't necessarily mean the women are there. Well, my Bible says the tearing of the clothing was a customary way of showing deep sorrow, yep. mourning, and despair. Yep. Yeah, they, uh, well, uh, that was their way of grieving, even in Jesus' day. I mean, you know, time. That's, that was, I, well, they would even uh, put dirt. <laughs> they used to put dirt and, and uh, that, and yeah. Uh, this is the King James version. They said they rent their clothes. Instead of saying rent, they would say they rent their clothes. Yeah. We old people remember that. <laughs> I can't say I remember that, but but uh, I do know what it means. Uh, and, you know, here they are. They're being so dramatic, aren't they? Yeah, that, and, and that's why when I read the, um, the thing about the grapes and, and they thought they were grasshoppers, I thought, oh, they're being dramatic. And, and then I get in here and I'm like, oh, they were dramatic, but this is true. Yeah. So, if only we had died in this wilderness. Tragically, that is precisely what happened to those people because of this incident. I thought that was cool that he put that there, the author that is. Uh, three, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? Oh, my word. This is, that is good. I mean, like it says, the people had made this false accusation against God many times before. The Lord had wrought countless miracles, defeated powerful foes, removed immovable objects, provided for all their physical needs, and even given them a worship place that moved with them wherever they went. Yet they accused him of being treacherous. They must be brave or stupid. I, I, can you, I, I can't even imagine uh, you know although I have a story I had a, I had two women young women who lost their husbands within a week of each other one was in my department she was a Christian the other was in um, worked in the department next to us which was underwriting and uh, she was a Christian also but not one that went to church every Sunday or whatever well, I felt so badly for these two women. So I came and spoke with Pastor Chuck, knowing that he had little booklets that you would give to a grieving person. Yeah, yeah, the Stephen Ministry books. Are yeah, so, he, so I asked for two of them, and I took them in, and I gave them each one of these books. Well, the woman in my department, she blamed God. She took the book home, laid it on her table, and never looked at it. And all she did was talk about how God killed her husband. And the other lady, who was not a regular churchgoer, read the book and felt comfort in it, you know? And, I, and I'm wondering, okay, 
So I prayed for both of these women because, I mean, it's sad. I mean, it's one thing, you know, if you're older and you've lived your life and you, you know, it still hurts when you lose your husband. But, you know, here they were young. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking probably early 40s, maybe late 30s. And so people that worked around the woman in my department were getting really upset with her. And so they formed a committee <laughs> and they came to me. Because at that time, I was, uh, I was AVP of the department. So they came up to me and they said, what are we going to do with her? And I said, I've been praying for her. And I've given her a book that if she only would read it, you know, I think she would find comfort and she would understand that God had nothing to do with it. Oh, well, they went back and talked to her. And they told her that when she was at work, she had to work. And she had to stop this blaming God for her husband's death because they didn't want to hear it anymore. So they did more than, I mean, if I would, I wouldn't have ever said that. You know, I would have been a little kinder about it. But they were upset because they're trying to work. But you have to understand, these are my 800 line operators, okay? So they're on the phone, and, and when she's not on the phone, she's complaining and complaining. And, uh, and so somebody convinced her to pick up the book, and she did. And she came in the office. It, she must have read it over the weekend because she came in the office on Monday, and she said, I am so sorry. Because the book explains, you know, you're going to go through this, this grieving. But it's not God's fault, you know. And she was blaming God. But see how fast, you know, how fast she turned on God because her husband died at an unusual age. But he had, he was a runner. I mean, to look at him, you would think he was a very healthy specimen. But he died from a heart attack on a run. Didn't know he just had a heart attack and it killed him. And, and so she blamed God for it. And, but when she read the book and everything, it helped clarify things to her. And so, I mean, she stopped going to church and everything. Uh, so, you know, here, here they are. All the stuff that just happened in this past year that God did for them. And right away, it's God's fault, right? It's God's fault. They should have stayed in Egypt. Or, well, now they want to get a new leader, right? Now they want someone else to lead them instead of Moses and Aaron. But that's not going to happen. Okay, reading on. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Moses said to the Lord, Then Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, O Lord, are with these people, and that you, O Lord, have, seen, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to death all at one time, the nations will have heard this report about you, will say the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the desert. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, 
Forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you ask. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt, contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. So, interesting, my Bible is also the same then. It, it says um, um, it's generic, you know. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but it, he does he mentions Caleb, but he doesn't mention Joshua. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, but we know Joshua's going. Yeah. Uh, I think. Uh, I think we're supposed to understand that Joshua was going because he he was his attendant and everything. Well, Moses probably thinks he is too. Yeah, but, Moses but well, yeah, well, you find out about that next week. I know we do. Uh, you know, so if we um, he really skips around. He once we get past nine, then he goes to twenty two, and you know. Uh, well, we know about the tearing of the clothes. Uh, Joshua and Caleb, uh, at verse 7, it says, an exceedingly good land. Joshua and Caleb focused on the blessings of the land rather than on the obstacles. But that didn't turn them around because they were outnumbered, right? Ten to two. <laughs> and, uh, and so... Uh, even all the 12 men, it said, had the same basic facts to work from, but Joshua and Caleb reached a radically different conclusion. And in our own lives, there will be times when obedience to God will seem hard, maybe even impossible. In those instances, we must rely on his character and his promises and choose to trust and obey him even when it is difficult to do. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, well, you know, we talked about them. I mean, they had fear. They had fear for the people of the land, but not all of them. The only ones they were really afraid of were the big guys. Um, and under 9, verse 9, it says, um, we'll swallow them up. Uh, they are our bread, is what he says. Uh, the ten spies had said they were like grasshoppers in the sight of the Canaanites. Joshua and Caleb retorted by saying emphatically that God's people would devour the giants like pieces of bread. And uh, so, but uh, the Bible says swallow them up, but they said... Uh, Well, they, uh, they, uh, they thought that they were going to be eaten, you know, by the people. It says, do not fear them. That's the big message here. It's once again, we see a commandment concerning fear, you know, uh, but uh, he could say it all he wanted and it wasn't going to help. It says, we tend to think of fear as an emotion, and as such beyond our conscious control. But God's word states repeatedly that we must choose not to permit fear to rule our thoughts. When fear rises in our hearts, we must conquer it by deliberately choosing to place our faith in Christ. 
Okay. Uh, I'll start uh, where I stopped at six. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'll start at 17. I think that's where I need to start. Now, may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to. Oh, no, I did read that. Oh, I need to start with 20. Sorry about that. The Lord replied, I have forgiven. No, where did I stop? You stopped. You, you need to start at 26. Okay. Oh, I was further along than I thought. This is an important section. Uh, from a prior study, I don't know where, but I underlined verses 28 through 31. Uh, and I, I didn't highlight them. Uh, and actually, he doesn't even take notice of them. Uh, he, he skips this whole section. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, starting with 26. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of those grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. In the desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb and Joshua. As for your children that you said would be taken as blunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. Um, but you, your bodies will fall in this desert. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your own faithfulness until the last of your bodies lie, lies in the desert. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community, which has band together against me. They will meet their end in their desert. Here they will die. So the men Moses has sent to explore the land, who returned and made the whole community grumble against him, by spreading a bad report about it, these men responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua and Caleb survived. And they are the only two out of the adults that go into the promised land. In fact, Joshua leads them. Um, I'm not going to read the rest. He stops with 38, which is the probably the most, you know, I thought it was interesting, you know, how God told Moses and Aaron what, how it was going to happen. He's not going to help them. For 40 years, they wander in the wilderness and they die off. And next week's lesson uh, it, we move to chapter 20, and it's no water in the wilderness, it's called. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see how he handles that. Of course, um, yeah, it skips all the way to 20. Yeah. Well, and I was looking at it. They're, they're talking about um, garments. garments, procedures. Regulations. Um, yeah. And... Uh, well, and the, uh, you know, 19 is the water of cleansing, um, and 20 is the water from the rock. Uh, that's, uh, it is only 20 we're going to look at, isn't it? Yeah, 20, 1 to 29. Um, and we'll see Aaron dies. But, so, it'll be interesting. Um, I had forgotten that this story was in Numbers. But anyway, we're at the questions. Um, question one. Put that there. If you had been one of the spies, how would you have reacted to seeing giants? 
to strong walled cities and to huge grapes. I would have been afraid. Okay. I don't understand that. Anybody else? I think I'd have been afraid too, but I think I would have been in, <clears throat> in awe too because it wasn't what you were used to seeing. Do you, do you know what I mean? The grapes yeah. and everything else and, and the giants. I hope I would have trusted God to take care of me. Well, I, I could. I, I would have probably had to throw the prayer to pray to God. <laughs> um. I, th I think if you're, uh, if you're really truthful with yourself that there would be, it might not be the foremost emotion. I mean, I can't even imagine grapes that big. I, th I would have been surprised at these grapes. And I've never seen a giant, so I mean, I've seen big men, but not a giant. And, and to look at them and, and under, especially a giant, I mean, a, a big person, you know, uh, I think there would be some underlying fear there, but along with it is surprise and like being inquisitive, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the grapes. I'm fascinated by these huge grapes. I mean, it just, you know, um, but um, it says, I, you know, <laughs> walled cities might have been a surprise if no other cities they had seen done this. But yet God gave them that option, didn't they? He said on walled or fortified walls. So apparently there are other cities that are walled. And I think the only reason, that shouldn't have been a surprise necessarily. I think the only reason that was even put in there was because they wanted to create a strategy on how, because they were there. They were sitting on the other side of the Jordan River, and all they had to do was cross the Jordan River, and they were in the Promised Land. So they're looking at strategy. So they, these are the questions they needed answered to come up with the right strategy to cross the river and do it, which eventually they do do, but not now. Okay. I would have been curious, too, I think. I don't know. He didn't exactly give him a positive message. Well, no, but he's, he's, he's trying to come up with the information for a strategy for war. I mean, these are questions I'm sure that God more or less, you know, led him. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did, question two, why did the ten spies say they could not defend their enemies? Why did they not rejoice in the wealth of the land? There's one word. Fear. Yeah. Fear took it and lack of faith, too. I mean, because uh, they didn't trust the Lord anymore. They saw those giants, and that was the end of it, you know? Uh, it was like they... And they knew they didn't feel they were going to win against their enemies. Right. They, they didn't have the trust in, in God that he would protect them and, and help them. Question three, why did Joshua and Caleb say that the Israelites could defeat their enemies? And how was their focus different from the others? They were, were, were relying on their faith <clears throat> and what they'd already seen God do. Right. Yeah, they, they hadn't lost their faith. I put they relied on God's love, patience, forgiveness, and mercy. Yep. Yeah. Well, he didn't let them down. He got them out of Egypt, right. and he got rid of the army, and he, he made sure they had uh, food and water crossing in the wilderness. You know, they trusted him, and they never lost that focus. Question four. If you had been in the Israelite camp, 
Which report do you think you would have listened to and why? You know, it's really hard to have this question. Yeah, this, there's this, eight people saying one thing and two saying another. It looks like, you know, mm -hmm. the eight one over the two. You know, what's really hard is for us to put ourselves in that place because we, as citizens of this country, we don't have to defend ourselves. We have an army that defends us. These people didn't have an army. So if, if whatever your profession was when you got to the Jordan River, you, it wasn't a soldier. And then they were expecting you to go in and be a soldier. Mm -hmm. that, that makes it very hard, and it's hard on the whole family. It's hard, to put you, it's hard for me to put myself in that position. Well, yeah. yeah so it, it, you know. Well, it's hard for us because we, I mean. We didn't live in those times. No. No. I said, I hope <laughs> I would have listened to the good report. Yeah, why didn't some, some of the people like to kill me? Well, maybe some of them did, but they were outnumbered. And I put, I would wanted to have known how many others of my people were more willing to fight with God to win. And yeah, we don't know. We don't, I mean, we're led to believe more or less that everybody yeah. went with, and everybody means the men. Remember that. Uh, and so, and you're right. They weren't soldiers. Right. No. Okay. Um, exploring the meeting. Our mental focus affects our faith, and we can see that at work here. Um, the different, uh, I'm going down to the second paragraph, and I have it underlined and highlighted, is the difference lay in what the spies focused on. Ten of them admitted there were, uh, were lots of big grapes, but their main concern was with the giants and the walled cities. They were focused on problems that lay ahead of them and their own strengths to overcome these problems. Joshua and Caleb, however, were focused not on the immediate obstacles, but on the prize that lay beyond those obstacles. And I underlined and highlighted this. They were concentrating solely on God's power and faithfulness in the past. The kind of faith, this kind of faith is not the power of positive thinking. It is conscious decision, often repeated to place our trust in God's provision rather than in the problems that stand in our way. And I liked the scripture verse at the bottom of that. It comes from Hebrews 13. It says, he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The second section is we must choose to be of good courage. God's words frequently commands us to be of good courage and fear not. These are commands not suggestions or mere words of encouragement. While it is true that the emotion of fear will come on us at times, what we do with that fear is a matter of will and obedience to God's command. Joshua and Caleb no doubt experienced the same emotion of fear as the 10 other spies. However, because of their greater faith in God's provision, they were able to resist and overcome that natural human emotion. And the last paragraph in that section, the principle goes hand in hand with the previous one. Our mental focus affects our faith. By consciously focusing our minds on the promises and character of God, our faith is strengthened and enlarged. We are better able to resist fear because we remember the many ways that God has been faithful in the past. It becomes easier and easier for us to trust him 
because we know he was faithful in the past. So the last section is our lack of faith may lead others into sin. So what I highlighted here is, is over on page 106. Um, in the second paragraph, it says, focusing on circumstances rather than on God, thereby losing our faith in his promises is a sin. That sin is compounded when our lack of faith infects others. The things that we say matter, our words affect our own attitudes, and they also affect the opinions of those around us. If our speech is filled with fear and woe, we will influence others to be filled with fear and woe. But if our speech is filled with an expectation of God's faithfulness, other will, others will be encouraged to trust him. And at the bottom of that section, I've highlighted and uh, highlighted, our faith is strengthened each time we trust, we trust God. And we strengthen the faith of others by showing forth our faith in him. Okay. Question five. What role did the ten spies play in the despair of the nation? And what role did each individual play? Yeah, they brought fear back and, um, and what did they, what was the only thing they talked about? The giant. Yeah. So by not telling the truth and being so negative, people became discouraged. They didn't say anything positive except the grief. And I wasn't sure where they were going with what role each did each individual person play. Uh, I mean, did the, each individual listen to the negativity of God, from God, God's promises, and God's miracles? Well, if you're looking at the individuals as the Israelites that were listening to the ten spies, yeah, uh, yeah, because they had they. They were so convinced with their fear that they would never be able to go into that, you know, the promised land and win. And, and they kept expressing that and, you know, and then people talk and they talk and, they, and they're all passing it around, you know, to these 200,000 people. So, yeah, 600,000 people. Yeah. over the whole mob and apparently it took over most of the people. Yeah. And I believe they let fear guide them. Yeah, they did. And if the women said, no, why don't you listen to them? No. <laughs> well, they wouldn't even open their mouths. <laughs> they knew better. <laughs> they knew better. Okay. Um, question six. Why are we commanded to be of good courage? Oh. <laughs> and how is this done and in practical terms how can a person overcome fear I don't I, 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 well okay this is what I wrote be of good courage means to believe in God and not let fear make the decision of what we are to do to be closer to God through worship fellowship prayer and scripture uh, that's how you overcome fear you let God guide you. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to be afraid, but you're not going to let it rule. And that's what God, you know, that's what God wants. He wants you to rely on him. 
Well, you can have the fear, you know, but still rely on God. And you do that through different forms, prayer, worship, whatever. I didn't like his negativity about, he, he's making a, a, a negative thing about, um, oh, what's his name? Norman Vincent Peale, the, the power of positive thinking. I mean, that goes back decades ago. But I had a mother-in-law that saw everything negatively. And when she started, um, she was looking one of those evangelists, on, and they were all positive, it actually helped her. She started to look at things positively. So I think there is some something positive about trying to look at things that way. You know, I, I agree. And, <clears throat> and for those folks who constantly focus in on the news, the yeah. news is always negative. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, next thing you know, they're negative. So so I agree with that. I mean, I, I agree. If that's all you hear, that's that, that becomes your personality. Well, you think it's everybody's focus. Mm -hmm. Now, I, don't, I haven't watched the news probably in 50 years. I, I, my father-in-law, because um, he lived with us, and he uh, had to watch the news at 6 o'clock and at 11 o'clock. That was fine, because at 11 o'clock, I was in bed anyway. But at 6 o'clock, I would find something else to do because I didn't want to hear all that. And, and now, I don't believe anything any of them say. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we. I, I remember when the news. It was only from eleven to eleven fifteen. That was it. And puppets gave us the weather. Right. And puppets. That's right. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, the weather is okay. Yeah, you know. Now that doesn't mean that I I live in some little box. I mean, I go on the internet, but there I can pick and choose what I want to read or what you know. Uh, I mean, I want to be. Uh, informed, but I just want to pick and choose what I want to be informed about. Uh, you know, I. It's on our phones. It's you know. Oh, yeah. it's, really? it's not on my phone. Well, it's like you know, if you just speak that way, you can <laughs> see the stories. <laughs> the bi biggest thing closest to news on my phone is the weather app. My daughter does everything on her this phone. Sweet and sunshine, tell nothing oh. about the uh, Oh yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, moving on to question seven. By the way, that, this is our last question. I didn't do eight. Uh, you know I don't do them if it asks for your life, from your life. Uh, what are some of the things God has done previously to prove to the people that he was in control? See, this is where I have such a problem. I mean, he was with them. You know, well, that's part of it, right? But he, he literally he was with them the whole time, in front of them and behind them, and, and he was visible. They didn't trust him, I mean, right? Like, Holy yeah. cow! So, and they knew he was there. Yes, but he did not leave them. He was always there, looking after them. He freed them from slavery. He provided food for them. He had given them Moses, but mm -hmm. they were still full of fear and did not have. And they had the cloud and the fire, yeah. you know, yes. which is God's presence, and then the movable worship center that they did all that. Well, yeah, they that did, right, right. They, they had a, they had a temple. Yeah. But that wasn't enough. Mm -mm. <laughs> they were all positive about that. Yeah. yeah. They, they all jumped in to, to help and bring stuff. Well, that was the last time. <laughs> Currently, that was the last time they were yeah, positive. Went back to their old ways. Yep. Well, you know, uh, you learn over time. <laughs> the Israelites have issues, <laughs> and they still do. You know. Anyway, next week, chapter twenty. I think it is the whole chapter too. Doesn't it go, or, or does it go? I marked my Bible so. Yeah, it only goes to 29. Wow, that'll be a fast lesson. <laughs>